Good afternoon, I'm Ron Geffner. I'm with the law firm of Sadis and Goldberg, and today we're here to talk about the Department of Labor fiduciary rule. We're gonna clear up some misconceptions and make this uh, appear very relevant to you in the audience. Uh, I'd like to thank my guests for coming. Dan, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Thanks, Ron. Uh, pleasure to be here. My name is Dan Viola. I'm a partner at Sadis and Goldberg. I head up the regulatory and compliance group and I've been helping my clients uh, with the, the Department of Labor's new fiduciary rule, and I'm hoping to uh, impart some knowledge today about what's happening. Greg? My name is Greg Zioli. I'm the CEO of Umpire Asset Management, um, and I'm here to discuss how this is gonna affect our customers, our advisors, and um, what we can do to make it easy for anyone forward facing. Steve? Right. Thanks, Greg. Uh, I'm Steve Bloom with RBC Correspondent and Advisor Services. I'm the Director of Fiduciary Strategies. Uh, we spend a lot of our time working with uh, advisors as well as firms about uh, how to navigate through the rule. What is the impact for advisors? What is the impact uh, to organizations? And ultimately, what is the impact to investors? So glad to be here. Thanks. I'm Tom Maluli. I own a, a fee-only registered investment advisory firm in Monmouth County, New Jersey. Uh, we've been also looking at the Department of Labor changes and how it's going to affect our clients as well. Great. So, Dan, why don't we start off with you letting the audience know what is this rule? Give us an overview, please. Sure. So, the, uh, the Department of Labor has introduced the new fiduciary rule, which is scheduled to take uh, effect uh, on April 10th of next year. Uh, there's also a transitional uh, period of time uh, where advisors are now doing some things to, uh, and brokers are now collecting information and reviewing things to be on track for that date. There has been some discussion that perhaps uh, with the new presidential elect, Trump, there, there could be some changes uh, with respect to the implementation date, uh, but so far it, it's, it's scheduled to take uh, effect on April 10th, and it's really forced a lot of uh, brokers uh, to evaluate their revenue streams with respect to retirement accounts. Uh, the Department of Labor and, and other government agencies are very concerned about the, the, the retirement market and how these accounts are being charged fees. Uh, so we've got a situation now where we have uh, a lot of disruption. Uh, a lot of uh, brokers are upset. They don't quite understand uh, why they have to change their ways. But for the first time, the uh, ERISA uh, requirements are now going to impact brokers. So you're moving away from a suitability requirement into a fiduciary requirement. And you know, to be a fiduciary to a client is a very uh, important duty. Uh, you really have to evaluate what's in the best interest of that particular account. Uh, so uh, there's basically two choices that a lot of the brokers are, 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 are wrestling with right now. One is whether they should follow what's called the best interest contract exemption or the BIC exemption or the level fee option, uh, which will basically uh, impact your analysis and how, the way you treat your accounts. If you decide to follow the more onerous BIC exemption, there's a number of different uh, requirements that you have to start to implement. Uh, including reviewing your contracts to make sure that your contracts have specific provisions. You actually have to give notice to the Department of Labor uh, that you're following the big exemption. And it allows you, uh, the broker, to charge variable compensation, uh, but you have to do it with the understanding that it's in the best interest of the client now. Uh, so you'll have to uh, you basically follow the impartial conduct standards and uh, really document and benchmark against what is reasonable. A lot of people feel that's too onerous, and they're moving to a level fee option, which is essentially a, an asset-based fee or a fixed fee type of arrangement. You can use grids and different uh, asset levels as well. Uh, but this is the, is the level fee is designed to be a little bit more easy. It's, it's, it's maybe more akin to what a, a, stra a standard fee-only advisor would be doing, uh, not collecting two, three different levels of, 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 of fees. Uh, so right now, uh, Ron, there, there are basically two uh, dividing paths. One is, you know, do, do, do you file the big exemption for your clients or do you file the level fee exemption? And it's creating a lot of discussion. The, the Department of Labor did put out some frequently asked questions uh, on October 27th of this year. They're scheduled to send out another 34 questions or, or answers, uh, you know, either this, this week or next week, and we're still waiting to hear. And, and Tom, you mentioned your fee only. That's right. And Dan had mentioned variable fee right. and level fee. For those people in the audience who may not really know the difference, can you sort of explain it sure. to them as if they're at my level of intelligence? Uh, I don't know if I can get down there. Uh, <laughs> but uh, one of the things that uh, I, I think really distinguishes a fee-only advisor is that we have to disclose our fee schedule right up front as we're beginning the relationship with a client. And so we mark out a schedule 
uh, based on the assets under management, what their fee is going to be, and we do the math for them and show how it's going to be uh, calculated and billed on a quarterly basis, regardless of the investments that they have in the account. And the variable fee, what's the difference? So the variable fee would be a completely separate agreement that you'd have with a client. Uh, that would be something that would be based more on products than anything else. Our firm, we're a fee-only advisory firm, so we just work on a level fee with our clients based on the assets. And when Dan was saying grid, I presume you mean as you have certain amounts of assets under management with the manager, the flat fee would go down? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Just to clarify for everybody who's listening in. So now we, you mentioned also there have been some debate as to the President-elect Trump, how it might impact the the effective date or implementation of the Department of Labor rule. What, you know, Greg or Steve, what are your thoughts on that to add a fresh voice? Yeah, go ahead, Greg. Um, you know, I think that there's been a lot of argument and caucusing about what's going to happen with President Trump. Um, I think that the real, the real challenge here is it takes so much planning to implement the DLL rule in effect by April 10th, 2017. The risk if it does not get delayed, would be too great to anyone's business, either a level fee or a broker dealer. Because essentially, if you're not in compliance by April 10, 2017, and it doesn't get delayed, you're really not going to be able to service any of your customers. Um, and then you're going to put them in an awkward position, and importantly, the firm in an awkward position. So I really don't think that you can go under the premise that it's going to be delayed. We, I think that there are some challenges with the rule, but uh, I think that the rule is in the best interest of the customers, I think it's a good thing. I think that once people embrace it, there are some, I think, perversions on how it's been interpreted. But overall, I think it's a good rule, but I don't think that you can go under the conception that um, it's going to be delayed. It's too dangerous for yourself and, and, and the firm. So, like, and Steve, do you have any additional yeah, thoughts I mean, to I, add to I, that? I would add, add to that. You know, certainly in, in the role that we serve in the custody and clearing business, we're working with organizations at various points in, in their preparedness. So this question has come up a lot. And you know, uh, the point of view that, that we're taking is very consistent with what you're talking about, Greg. And th the work to go into sort of structuring your practice or structuring your firm in such a way to be able to define and, and, and evidence and document best interest is going to take a fair bit of work. And there's also some work to do at the individual client level. We want to make sure that we're really understanding where our clients are at, which clients that we want to move into that capacity, and that's going to take some time. And so, so we are absolutely you know, continuing to, to move forward, and we're encouraging basically everybody we work with to do the same. So when you're saying there's work at the client level, can you sort of extrapolate a little further so I know what that means? Yeah, you know, I, I think there's a couple of things to look at here, sort of depending on your point of view, if from an advisor point of view or from a client point of view. But as we move into, into the world of fiduciary standard, this idea of best, best interest, I think we conceptually all agree that that's a good thing for our industry. The question is, what does it look like and for what clients does it make sense? So I think you know, one of the things that all advisors need to be looking at is they need to be looking at their business right now and really uh, taking a, a hard look at what do they actually provide in terms of services for those clients. I mean, it's, it's almost like, Welcome to the service economy, compliments of the DOL. I mean, as we move into sort of the best interest world, the idea of really compensation for service becomes re real important. So we need to look at all of our client relationships, determine what the actual client needs are there, maybe in a deeper and more comprehensive way than we have before. And that's going to take some time. So I, I we really encourage you know, all advisors to begin to do those things sooner, start to have those conversations so you can determine which clients it makes sense to move into that type of relationship with and which clients it may make sense to potentially take a different path. Tom, you're looking really excited to answer something. So well, I wanted to just jump in and say that uh, really, in my opinion, the, the bottom line is good things for consumers in that it brings on more disclosure and more discussion. And I, I, I just don't understand why there would be people who want to walk back this uh, regulation. I mean, it might get delayed, but I, I think more disclosure and more discussion is always going to be good for the consumer. And what kind of disclosure do you expect to see? And I ask that because as a consumer of investment products, I will get statements. And I'm a lawyer in the space. Right. And I'm reading through the fine print. And then it's very, it, it becomes very confusing to me. Right. So I imagine, well, how do you envision some of the disclosure to look? This might be a better question for the others. I mean, we, okay. we start out uh, you know, by uh, giving our clients the, the fee schedule and the investment agreement right up front. We have to disclose everything, any kind of particular conflicts in our investment agreement when we get started with a client. So all of that gets disclosed up front. We're already doing a lot of things that 
that the rest of the world is catching up to um, as fee-only advisors. Greg? You know, it, it's interesting to, to touch on, on Tom because I think that there's this general misconception, especially to some of the consumers that you pointed out, that advisors have not already been acting in the best interest of the customer. And this is going to be something new. That for the past 50 years that there was no best interest of the customer looked forward. I think that the misconception is, is that generally I'd say most advisors and brokers acted in the best interest. But this is really going to clear up any conflict that there could be. As Tom said, as a, as a level fee advisor, when you get their form ADV, all of the possible conflicts are listed for a client to read before they enter into the agreement, whereas brokers haven't had that same amount of disclosure. So I, I don't want a consumer to get confused to say, or, or be angry to say, well, my interest has not been looked at for the, for the previous 10 years. It has. It's just, it's refining it and it's making it better. So is it safe to say as a consensus, each of you believes this is in the best interest of the consumer at the end of the day? Yes, absolutely. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I want to thank each of you for coming and your participating today, and we look forward to hearing more from you as we get closer to the date. Thanks thank so you. much for watching.